question for you. Let's How many of you have already seen a brief introduction to Virgin Galactic and know about it? Or, who hasn't? Who does not know about Virgin Galactic? Okay. Who does not know about XCOR? Would anyone be offended if Jim and I skipped our slide decks, which were introductions to those two companies, because we're having some technical difficulties, and went straight to just having a conversation? No one would be offended by saying. All right, let's go for it. That's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do anyway. Let me see if we can get a mic so we can just pass so we can. Uh, Great. Great. I'll go sit over on the uh, right side. Well, your bag's over there. I'll sit here wherever you want. I'll sit here. I'll sit here. I've got a mic. Then I can duck behind this when they throw it to the There you go. Thanks for accommodating us, everyone. Uh, and I'll send slides to SEDS to put on the website uh, so you won't be totally bored. Uh, or whatever. <laughs> Here we are. All right, well, let's, I'll just do it with the one minute introduction of each of us and then, uh, and then maybe, hell, let's just move straight to the questions. That seems most interesting to me. I'm happy to babble. Uh, I could babble for a long time. Why don't you talk a few minutes about Virgin and how you're doing? Sure. And, and then I'll do sort of give them a quick, quick intro to intro explore yeah. as well. Okay, well, hi, I, I think I know essentially all of you in the audience, but for those of you I haven't met yet, I look forward to meeting you uh, later in the evening and, and throughout the weekend. My name's Will Pomerantz. I'm Vice President for Special Projects at Virgin Galactic. I am also a SEDS alum, having uh, run a chapter for a couple of years and remained involved uh, with the program ever since. Uh, always happy to, to speak to SEDS students, whether at conferences or uh, offline. Um, you all said you've, you've ra you all raised your hands and said you've heard of Virgin Galactic, but in case there's anyone on the web stream that hasn't, uh, we are a, a private company that is building spaceships to take you and your experiments into space. Uh, so what we did is licensed the technology that built Spaceship One, that was the first ever privately built uh, spacecraft to carry human beings into space. It flew three times in the, in the summer and the fall of 2004. Uh, now hangs in the Air and Space Museum. And it was really the existence proof that a small company uh, of dedicated individuals who had only private funding, no government funding, could safely send people to space and bring them back. Uh, that whole vehicle program went from a drawing on a napkin to hanging in the world's most visited museum for about $27 million. And for that amount of money, it didn't just fly people into space, it fly, flew people into space repeatedly. And that's a pretty big deal, because uh, I think in the space industry, um, so much of what we do in every aspect of the space industry is driven by the cost of access to space. And so much of the cost of access to space is driven by the flight rate of access to space. If you are, uh, if you were a fan of the space shuttle program, if you followed that closely, you're probably already aware that the space shuttle program was gonna cost a few billion dollars a year, whether we flew it or not, because almost all the cost associated with that program was the cost not of exotic rocket propellants, it was the cost of people. It was the cost of the, the, the army of engineers uh, and technicians, all of whom were highly skilled and patriotic, um, but cost a lot of money to, to keep that vehicle uh, in flying condition or to get it back into flying condition after every flight. Uh, by contrast, Spaceship One and now Spaceship Two are ready to fly you know, maybe as soon as the day after. Uh, it's just come back from space. Now, we're not doing the space shuttle's job. We're going suborbital. It's a lot easier to be ready for that. But that was also baked into the cake. It was a fundamental part of the design of these vehicles. Let's build something that we can fly today and fly the same thing again tomorrow and fly the same thing again the day after that. Uh, so we, and by we I speak broadly, I mean both Virgin Galactic and our friends at Scale Composites, uh, have built the first vehicle pair. We use a, an air launch system, so we have both an aircraft that carries our spaceship up to altitude and the spaceship itself. Uh, we built the vehicle, the first pair, uh, the first of each vehicle. They're in the flight test program now. As many of you have heard me say, we're essentially done with the uh, flight test program for the mothership, White Knight 2. She's flown like 103 or 104 times. Uh, now it is basically done. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, the spaceship was built second, so she is not quite as far along, but coming along nicely. She's just finished her subsonic flight test program uh, a few months ago and is getting ready to start supersonic flight test program. Um, we try not to put firm dates on when we're going to fly, because the real answer is we're going to fly when we're damn good and ready. Uh, we need a vehicle, as I said, that can go to space. It can do it routinely, can do it affordably. It also has to do it safely and has to do so comfortably. Um, if our first customers come down and they didn't like the ride very much, that's not good for business, especially when your first customer is Sir Richard Branson. 
as it is for us. Uh, we want him to come home all smiles and to give us a nice pat on the back rather than a stern talking to. So uh, we're well on our way to that. Um, looks like flight operations could be, you know, not too much more than, than a year, year and a half, two years away. Uh, it's, that's a number that's thrown around a lot in this industry, two years away, and, and uh, we, we certainly have been uh, part of that trend in the past. But, uh, but as Jim was saying to some people before uh, we got started here, you, you can see that this is real. The vehicles exist. You can walk up and touch them if we let you. You can certainly see pictures and video. Come out to Mojave, we, we bring them out on the flight line relatively frequently because we're flying them a lot. Uh, and that's the way that you get to these uh, uh, affordable and frequent operations. Um, we have a pretty long order list. In fact, we've now sold more tickets to space than there have been people to space. We are also starting to uh, take on customers who are, hey, it's your slides. <laughs> oh my God. Our vehicle is not that one, uh, as, as most of you recognize. Uh, we, yeah, we've, we've sold more tickets to space than there have been uh, people to space. We're at 545, get close to 550. Uh, the total number of human beings in space uh, throughout history is 528, I think, as of today. Uh, we're also starting to sell to researchers. A few of you were at the panel just before this one that was about that. Uh, I get personally very excited about that. I don't really work on the space tourism side. I work on uh, other things. Uh, my background is in science, and I think it's extremely important that we have the ability for more of you to fly your payloads and yourselves into space more often. Uh, it's hard to do a whole lot of science if you only have 500 experimenters. Uh, you need 5,000 experimenters or 5 million experimenters who can do all kinds of different things. Uh, and you need, uh, you need young people as well as veterans uh, doing it. Uh, and then last thing I'll say before I hand over to, to Jim is uh, just a few months ago we announced our first orbital program. Now this is not for human astronauts but for payloads. Uh, it's called Launcher One. Uh, we can take about 500 pounds to orbit for prices below $10 million. Uh, and what we think we're doing with that is, is really for the first time giving um, the small satellite community, and small somewhat of a hand wavy term because everyone defines it differently, but giving the small sat community uh, a dedicated ride to space at a price that they can afford. Uh, a number of you from talking, from knowing several of you from talking to others of you earlier today, I know a lot of you have worked on CubeSats. CubeSats are fantastic. They're great ways for you as young professionals and as students to get experience. Increasingly, they're great ways for people to get actual substantive results, whether that's for a civil agency, for military, for university, or for private enterprises. Um, but there are a lot of limitations on CubeSats, as many of you have figured out. Even if you built one, that doesn't mean you need to fly it. When you can fly it, you can probably fly it pretty cheaply, maybe even for free, but you don't have any choice of when it's gonna fly. Uh, you probably don't have any choice about what orbit's gonna go to, or at least not much choice. And also, the bigger payload on that rocket that is kindly sharing their ride with you is gonna put a lot of limitations on you. So if you wanted to have propellant on board your CubeSat, that's probably not gonna happen in most piggyback launch situations. Uh, by contrast, if you've bought the launch yourself because it's at a much smaller price point that you can uh, affordably take on, you're in control. You launch the day you want to, to the orbit you want to, with whatever you want on board, within reason, obviously, for all those things. Uh, and, and we think that has a, a, the potential to be quite transformative. We've already signed up a number of commercial customers for that uh, who have payloads ranging from you know, sort of three U CubeSats to things that are gonna fill up our, our entire payload fairing and be close to 500 pounds. I think there's a real market demand for all those things. Um, so perhaps I'll stop there and, and hand over to Jim. Okay, how do I control the slides? Is this it? Does this work? Wow. <laughs> Okay, no, that didn't work. There, oh God, it's gotta be one by one. Now it went, it's still up on their screen. This screen is, uh, this screen is becoming, is finicky, okay. Um, back. Let's just skip it. Why don't you just blank it so it's not up? And I can just sort of talk people through the basic message anyway. So, okay. Um, so, um, x -Corps was founded in 1999. Um, for those of you who have noticed that not all commercial space companies are successful, it's an important lesson that x -Corps was founded by four people who were part of the propulsion team of another company, uh, which failed in the 1990s called Rotary Rocket Company. Uh, and they were developing uh, propulsion systems for the Roton. And uh, when Rotary failed, they took some of their ideas, they bought their intellectual property, 
uh, from the company and they went off and they started working on cheaper, faster, better rocket engines. Um, um, scaled composites, of course, is probably the most innovative uh, airframe company in the world, uh, designing with in innovative designs of, of, uh, of airplanes, aircraft, and, and things that can fly through the atmosphere. Uh, x -Core took a slightly different approach and what they wanted to focus on was highly reliable, reusable, robust, and very cheap to operate uh, liquid propulsion uh, systems uh, rockets, uh, entirely using non-toxic components, no, uh, no solids, and, no, uh, and more importantly, no, uh, uh, none of the toxic uh, storable propellants that are sometimes used in satellites and even uh, were used on the space shuttle. Uh, that said, they went about you know slowly building up with SBIR contracts and things like that, developing uh, two different versions of a, of a rocket-powered plane. One was the Easy Rocket, which they took a Burt Rutan Long EZ and flew that at Oshkosh with a two 400-pound uh, liquid oxygen alcohol engines in it. Uh, then they built uh, for a private customer. They developed the X Racer, uh, which had a liquid oxygen, liquid kerosene uh, engine in it, um, which ended up flying seven times in one day, which is the most liquid, you know, a rocket propelled airplane has ever flown uh, uh, in that amount of time. Um, it was a subsonic airplane. It was the based on the uh, uh, velocity aircraft. Uh, but it showed that you could turn around a rocket plane in as little as 10 minutes uh, from landing to takeoff. Uh, which is, the when you get to that sort of reusability, then you can get to the sort of cost, you know, the price points that you need to get when, when this market evolves. And that's sort of where Export has come from. If you look at the history of the automobile industry, companies, a lot, some companies were named so-and-so automobiles, but a lot of companies were named after the motors in them. Uh, Ford Motor Company, General Motors, uh, uh, Chrysler Motors, okay? And so that was the approach, that was the approach x has taken. Our neighbors uh, down the street at Mojave, Virgin Galactic, are, are building a bigger, more capable system. But the important thing that both companies have shown is the kinds of innovation you can get at the suborbital level, which is easier and cheaper to work with and doesn't require billions or hundreds of millions of dollars to start with. You know, it can be done with tens of millions or perhaps a hundred million dollars to start with. The technologies that are possible out of that do in fact lead to orbital access over time. And so Virgin's already showing that with Launcher One. The same technologies that x has been doing uh, using with piston pump, um, excuse me, um, um, piston pump uh, rocket technology um, has has been uh, looked at very favorably by the United Launch Alliance and we've been working with them several years to apply our piston pump technology to upper stage engines uh, for EELV class rockets. So uh, even little x core engines can, you know, 20,000 pound engines can uh, could be useful for launching, you know, multi, multi hundred million or billion dollar satellites uh, all the way to orbit. So that's been a very important thing for the industry because we have over the last 50 years sort of over concentrated space transportation in too few companies doing too few innovative things, not reducing the cost, prices keep going up, there's fewer payloads, fewer launches. And you get this, you know, vicious cycle of overconcentration and in price inflation, and you don't get the sort of dynamic, competitive environment we have, um, you know, for example, in the computer industry. Um, and that really is the vision that I think Virgin and Xcor and frankly all the other suborbital companies are working on is, you know, none of them just want to work on suborbital systems. Okay. We all want to build systems that can carry people and payloads to orbit uh, and eventually beyond, but we wanted to start where we could start and afford to start and learn by doing things smaller and slower and, 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 and build up over time and not try to say, well, if, we, if, if some person isn't going to give us a billion dollars to develop our perfect spaceship, we're not going to try. Um, 
and you will learn uh, in your own ways that in whatever technical field or business field uh, you want to go into relating to space, and I hope you all do go into space, you know, whatever, whatever area you're working on, whether it's a power system or uh, a kind of propulsion or, or a sensor or something like that, you know, find ways to try it out on a small scale. Find ways to, you know, don't try to, to, don't try to prove the whole hypothesis on the first experiment. Find a way to, 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 to try out part of it, you know, the, the part of it that you could work on first, that you could afford to work on first that someone will give you a chance to work on first. And then go from there and build and learn and build and test and build and test and redesign and test and test and test and, and learn by doing. Uh, learning by learning, by reading out of a book or reading an analysis or doing uh, computer-aided design is not the way to do space. Uh, the way to do space and to really get it cold and to really know what you're doing and know how it works is to actually build things and try them. Um, and uh, hopefully companies like Virgin and XCore will make it possible for more people to fly experiments and even students to fly experiments in, in space and eventually students to fly themselves into space to work with their experiments. Uh, and that's certainly, I think, the goal that both Will and I have. Um, one last uh, uh, bit of news about XCore is that XCore is growing right now. Uh, just as Virgin is, is perfecting their uh, uh, Spaceship 2 uh, and having perfected the White Knight 2. Uh, we are in the middle of building Lynx. Uh, we're building it right now in Mojave, which has been our headquarters. Uh, we are moving the R&D operations of uh, XCore uh, from California, frankly due to the business climate in California, to Midland, Texas. Uh, we'll be moving there in the spring of next year. Um, and if the flight test program isn't com uh, for Lynx uh, Mark I isn't complete by then, then we will stop the flight test program and move it with the, with the company to, uh, to Texas. Uh, we're opening up our, our new headquarters, our RV headquarters and flight test center in Midland. We will continue to fly uh, operationally the Lynx Mark I and then the Lynx Mark II in Mojave as a West Coast base. Uh, we really like Mojave, we really like uh, the spaceport, and we're very close friends with a lot of the people in the industry there. Uh, we don't leave Mojave, uh, you, know, leave, you know, move anyone for, out of Mojave uh, gladly. Uh, uh, but the fact is, is that we needed to find a better place to go off and, and, and do R&D uh, uh, with a, a, a more solid business base. The other thing we've announced is that we've, we're going to open up a manufacturing and operating location at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Uh, it's not absolutely decided that we'll be on Kennedy, Center, Kennedy Space Center grounds. It probably will. We're working, looking at locations. We're working actively with Space Florida. Um, we're getting some uh, help from the state. And uh, the folks at KSC are very excited about our coming there. And I think the uh, tourism community is very interested in having people fly to space every day from the Kennedy Space Center, uh, from Spaceport USA. So uh, we are hiring. There are job opportunities right now on our website. I would encourage you to go to xcore.com, look at them. Uh, I, would, I would absolutely recommend that you apply for internships. Unlike some companies, we actually require six months uh, because that's how long it takes for you to really start to, to feel part of the company and building things and, and really engaging in the technical work. And you will end up working across all sorts of different projects. You won't get stovepiped on one little project uh, that's like a project for students. You'll be working in technical reviews of engines or vehicles or flight tests or whatever. Um, so you will, get, you will have a lot of fun if you talk to some of our former interns who are now employees uh, who went to Embry-Riddle or, so, or Purdue or some other universities, you'll see that, that it, it is definitely a way into the company. Um, and finally, um, go break things. Go build things and test things and break things as students. Please, please don't just stay in, in the books or on the computers. Um, please go build and test things. Uh, uh, it would probably be better if you didn't just build another hybrid rocket, like a lot of college students do. Go, go find something you can play with uh, that's innovative and different. 
um, and, and, and figure out you know, some new thing or some way of trying something that no one's tried before. Um, build hardware, build software, do something real. That will help you in this industry more than anything else. It will particularly help you with x because we don't hire rocket scientists, we hire rocket engineers. We hear hire people who actually want to build things. Uh, and, um, and come aboard and let's go to space. So there. So uh, let's do Q&A. We have your microphone, so just say them and I'll try and repeat them for anyone who didn't hear them and on the webcast. If anyone is either watching live or too shy to speak up, uh, just tweet them with hashtag SV12 and I'll try and read them off. Uh, but I think we've got half an hour, and I'm hoping you'll have great questions. Otherwise, I'll just have to start asking Jim questions, and, and your questions will be more exciting than mine. Yes, please. Yeah, I was wondering uh, what uh, the greatest hurdles you've seen uh, for, for both companies from original conception to where we are today. And then the second question for you, Will, is uh, where the development is launched or launched. Okay, so two questions. One for both of us is what's been the biggest hurdle for the company from inception through today? And, and the second one was for, uh, for, for both, uh, or excuse me, it was, it was I guess just for us, what's the status of Launcher One? So here, I'll hand to Jim first. Uh, money? Oh, tech, technical hurdle. Oh, I, I, we had to do a lot of work on aerodynamics to make sure we got the design right. Uh, we ended up flying in a hypersonic tunnel at Marshall, and we kept tweaking and kept tweaking and kept tweaking it, and added strakes and added some things and moved things um, a little bit, um, mainly because we didn't have Bert working for us. So we, you know, we had we had to work on that. I think that was a big issue. Uh, the propulsion is just uh, we've been building engines and testing engines for 12 years now, so that wasn't as hard. But there were always chat. There were certainly a lot of work to do and a lot of learning to do along the way. Uh, let's see. For us, it's, it's probably a lot of little things rather than one big thing. Uh, and I think most of them are, are probably obvious and, and similar across uh, a lot of the companies. A, a big part of it is is integration. It's getting all these pieces that you've made work individually to work in harmony uh, and to work every single time. Um, I think for all of our companies. Uh, <coughs> We need systems that are, are going to work. Uh, we are very safety minded, as are the folks at XCore and all, all these other things. We uh, sometimes have a different approach to safety than NASA does, uh, but that doesn't mean that we aren't obsessed with making these vehicles very safe. Uh, the, the, the blunt reality of it is, is that all these vehicles need to be orders of magnitude safer than the space shuttle was, or, uh, or these businesses aren't going to uh, handle themselves for very long. So, so making all those things, getting a propulsion system that doesn't just have enough thrust, but it meets all the stability requirements and it meets all the other requirements, etc. Uh, fitting all the puzzle pieces together has been has been the challenge. I would say nothing that's insurmountable by any means, but um, but it's why we need the smart people, and, and I should say we're hiring as well. Uh, in terms of Launcher One, we just started that program, obviously a little bit before we announced it, but it is a new program. Uh, and it's one that we're doing in-house. So whereas we hired Scale Composites to build White Knight 2 and Spaceship 2, uh, we're hiring our own engineers. We are also we have subcontractors, certainly, but we are the lead integrator and the lead designer for Launcher 1, uh, which is super exciting. Uh, and it also means that our, our team has grown a lot. Uh, when I joined Virgin Galactic, uh, which was only 18 months ago, the number of people who actually had Virgin Galactic on their badge was probably 35 or 40, and I think we're getting close to, we're about to pass 100. Uh, in addition to our, uh, our our now subsidiary TSC, which is well over 100 themselves, um, so we uh, we were very pleased to um, win a uh, very competitively bid DARPA program called Alasa, which is for a uh, very small, very inexpensive air launched uh, rocket, and that's driving our schedule in a lot of ways. Uh, if we hope to win that program, uh, the next phase of it, which carries us through, you know, maybe as many as a dozen or two dozen test launches. We have to be in flight around 2015. It's an aggressive schedule. Uh, we've, we've brought in a lot of people who have a great experience, not only the people that we already had on staff who, who come from backgrounds at scale and TSC, uh, but we brought in people who have come from working on Pegasus and working on SpaceX and working on basically every rocket that's ever flown in this country, trying to get that right mix of uh, gray beards and fresh eyes um, to, to give us the best perspective on it. So it's coming along, I don't know, we're maybe sort of just pre-PDR type level uh, of on the rocket, uh, but moving very quickly and, uh, and on schedule.
Okay, please. I go to the front and then the back. How do you see the small sat market shaking out? SpaceX came out with Falcon 1 and they retired it. A Lockheed Martin floated from Athena for a while and that didn't really go anywhere. Corporal had some success with Pegasus. Where do you see the small sat launch market? Great question. The question was where do we see the uh, small sat launch market going, especially given that other companies have tried launch vehicles in that sector. And, and uh, either withdrew from them or, or didn't have the, the market to sustain them. Uh, it is a little bit of a field of dreams. We are building it, we hope that they come uh, kind of market. I think. Um, that is certainly the case. That said, um, we're super confident actually. Uh, when we, uh, we announced this vehicle launcher one uh, at the Farnborough Air Show uh, this summer, and uh, George Whitesides and Steve Isakowitz, which is our CEO and our CTO, came to me and, and gave me the job of trying to sign up a few customers before we had even announced this vehicle, much less started building it. Uh, and I said, well, I better start preparing my resume because that's going to be impossible. Uh, I wasn't sure if I could do it. Uh, we ended up signing uh, four, announce or excuse me, signing up five, announcing four of them uh, publicly. One of them is in the room, Planetary Resources, and please go see Chris's talk uh, later today and also pigeonhole him later. He's, he's one of the most interesting people at the conference. Uh, so we signed up those those five customers, uh, which would keep us probably at our saturation rate for where we are certainly supply limited rather than demand limited for a pretty long time, uh, if all of their projections hold true and, and the other companies that, that we've signed up. Um, the difference is we have to be extraordinarily disciplined about cost. If you take the example of Pegasus, when Pegasus was first announced and when they started working on it, I think even when they first flew it, it was designed to be what? A six million dollar launch vehicle, I want to say six or six or seven. Um, if you try to buy a Pegasus now, you're probably spending about thirty million dollars. Uh, now they have it is the Pegasus XL, so they, they've had some improvements of uh, of capability, but I think a lot of those, uh, a lot of that cost increase was not driven by capability increase; it was driven by process increase, uh, because their sole customer essentially effectively was NASA and NASA places a lot of burdensome technical requirements on it, and when they're your only customer, you can't say no. Um, we are building this almost entirely from private funding. We do have a small amount of money from DARPA. We are gonna be very disciplined, uh, and that means that we have to have the guts to tell a customer no when they want us to add a part, uh, and that part is gonna raise the basement level of our price up uh, to a point where we don't have any of our customers. Uh, we're not gonna do it. Uh, so I hope that if we do that and we keep the, the uh, sort of the quantum unit at which you can buy space flight in the single digit millions rather than the double digit millions, uh, I think there's a pretty substantial market there. Jim, let me just speak. Um, X-Core has a um, design for um, uh, an upper stage cowling uh, that goes on top of the links um, that will allow for a small expendable two stage rocket to launch a smaller payload than uh, Launcher One will on the order of 10 kilograms or so to LEO. Um, and the real question is going to be what turn out to be the sizes, uh, the capacities, and the, and, the, and, the, um, and the demand level for small sats? And how do they shake out? You know, a very smart man named Bill Gates once said that 640K ought to be enough for any, anyone. Um, you know, I, I suspect there isn't a phone in the room that's less than 640 meg. Um, um, so the question is, is what can people do? We, we have talked about much lower cost access to space for small payloads for a long time. And everyone keeps going to, and in, in, you, are, you are now seeing so much pressure um, on launch costs that you, you're seeing a real vigorous discussion going on about secondary payloads and trying to open up more secondary payload opportunities on larger rockets so that these small things can get aboard because the existing small providers, Pegasus mainly and, and, and Minotaurs uh, from Orbital, are just too expensive. And they got expensive partly because of government requirements creep, but also just because they became more expensive. There were failures. There were more, you know, more expensive to fly, fewer payloads, and 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 if you're a PI, you know, why not propose a mission that flies on a Delta uh, with the reliability of that, or or now on a Falcon 9? Um, if you're a scientist, if you're a scientist, uh, there's ever always pressure, more and more pressure to do bigger satellites, more capability, add another instrument, 
and, and you get the Battlestar Galactica effect. You know, the question is, is once you really do put a satellite on someone's desk, when you really do make it possible for someone to launch their own bird and do something with it for some period of useful amount of time, you know, whether it's a, a remote sensing satellite or a, a, a network of small comsats for uh, pri totally private uh, networking applications, you know, who knows? We just don't know whether, you know, Will, will people find out something that really useful and profitable they can do with 10 kilograms or 100 kilograms? Or does it take 1,000 kilograms? In which case, Launcher 1 has to get bigger, okay? And X4 has to build a much bigger system to ever begin talking about launching that much. So that's the challenge. And, we'll, and But the market will show. I mean, it, it will. It, we just have to start flying things. Sure. A few of us were in a workshop recently that was about. Hi. A few of us were in a workshop recently that was about training in the civil spaceflight industry, and we were talking a lot about whether companies such as Virgin or Xcore would prefer to train spaceflight participants in house or kind of let third party companies handle the training. So, what are your thoughts on on that? Well, that's a great question. So Xcore hasn't made a decision. Um, we have a general sales agent, um, uh, Space Exploration Corporation, Space Expeditions Corporation. Uh, that's also tied to our partners in Curacao. That uh, 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 is leasing a, a Lynx to operate there on the Caribbean. Um, we're working out those details, um, and if you have some interesting ideas, we'd love to hear from you. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, I think there's probably multiple answers, and it differs by market segment for us. For sort of the classical Virgin Galactic space tourism customer, if you look at those customers, a big part about what they're buying is it's the full experience. It's not just a space flight. It's joining the family of astronauts. It's joining the Virgin Galactic brand. It's the association with, with Sir Richard uh, and with, uh, with this beautiful building. Uh, so I think that for them, there will be a fairly, um, the, the minimum requirements of what you absolutely need to go to space and enjoy it, we will address. Now that said, for a lot of those people, they may want additional things. For example, they may want to learn to take a class on you know, photography or something like that. I, I think most of our, our, our passengers will not be spending their time looking at their viewfinder, certainly not on their first flight, but maybe someday there will be sort of extra add-on things or where they want to have even more time in a parabolic flight just to make sure they're really proficient at moving around at that. Uh, so there, there is probably a support market there. Um, alternatively, we are also going to fly people who are researchers. Uh, they are going to need a very different type of training, uh, and I suspect that there will probably be a lot of opportunities for other organizations to train them on how to do their experiment competently and comfortably, uh, because that won't be a, a, something that we've built into our program, because it'll be so different from, uh, from researcher to researcher. Uh, I'll go back to questions from the audience in a second, but there was one uh, for, for Twitter. Um, are there sort of ITAR or export control restrictions on who can buy tickets for rides on these vehicles? Uh, there are some. Uh, hopefully they uh, will be less and less as time goes on. Uh, I think for the foreseeable future, you know, if you're from North Korea or Iran, you're probably out of luck on any of these vehicles. Uh, but hopefully we can get the list of, of, of uh, individuals who are not able to buy a ticket to come to the U.S. and fly on one of these vehicles. Hopefully we can restrict that um, down as much as possible. There will be yet other restrictions on the use, on taking any of these vehicles and operating them from another nation. Uh, but I, I hope that also that those uh, that those are able to be overcome. Yeah, I think all I think all the companies have been able to get some um, approval. It's not a blanket approval, but an approval for a set of activities that are associated with the the spaceflight experience, the suborbital spaceflight experience, and um, gotten those things sort of generally approved um, by the State Department uh, as not. A, train, a major transfer of, of, of knowledge. Uh, ultimately, we just need to get spacecraft, generic spacecraft off the munitions list so that 
suborbital vehicles, which aren't really spacecraft because they're not, certainly not satellites, okay, are not just sort of included by uh, um, just sort of like the radiation effect or, you know, just, we, we got sort of thrown on, you know, ad hoc, uh, uh, even though, uh, you know, we're not satellites. Uh, and um, hopefully that hopefully that will happen, if not in re legislation uh, this year, hopefully next year. Next question. Um, there you go. Um, it had been mentioned in the spring by Steve Massad with that Richard Branson had wanted to develop point to point space flight. Is there anything going on in that area of Virgin now? Oh, sure. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, the question was, uh, Richard Branson has mentioned in the past wanting to, uh, uh, to do so, uh, point to point travel and, and are we working on that? Uh, we're definitely extremely interested in it. That is something that, uh, that Sir Richard is quite passionate about. It's something that a lot of us at the company are passionate about it. And, and you sort of notice, um, there was a spaceship one, there is now a spaceship two that implies a sequence. Uh, we have some ideas about what is Spaceship 2, or excuse me, Spaceship 3 and Spaceship 4 and, and beyond. Uh, and at some point those will become point-to-point -point vehicles. Uh, in fact, that was a portion of the impetus behind why we're doing Launch for One. It allows us to sort of play in some of that trade space and learn some lessons <coughs> that we will in the future apply to a point-to-point -point vehicle, whether directly or indirectly. Uh, so definitely we're thinking about it, we will get there. Um, that's not something we're going to debut next year or anything like that. It's, it's much more difficult to get a, a vehicle that is you could put into a useful point-to-point -point service. Now, if, if you want to do a demonstration and go from Mojave to Spaceport America, that may be something that's relatively near term in terms of technical feasibility. If you want to talk about routine service from, you know, from New York to London, uh, much less from New York to Shanghai, that, that's, you know, that's 20 times more energy or so. Uh, that's also, you're no longer just dealing with the FAA in the United States, you're dealing with at least two FAA equivalents. Maybe you have to deal with overflight rights depending on your uh, sonic boom signature and things like that. So it, it gets a lot harder. Uh, it's further down the road, but it, it will happen. Uh, there was a question actually from a lady a few rows back. There you are. Hi, uh, my name is Carly. I was wondering what you plan to do with profit of your company? Is that mostly going into maintenance of your vehicles or do you plan on creating new vehicles with that profit? Um, x is going to plow its profit back into its com into the company and and develop ever more increasing capable, cap increasingly capable vehicles. Um, to, to sort of address the question that was just asked, x has no plans whatsoever to do point-to-point -point transportation, okay? That is because the energy requirements of doing long-distance point-to-point transportation are the same energy requirements as going to space. And last I checked, you get a lot more money from, I mean, I'm sorry, all the way to orbit. And you, you make a lot more money flying to orbit than you do flying from New York to Shanghai. So we would prefer to be in the profitable industry of flying people to orbit. Uh, and only when we run out of people who want to fly to orbit as prices come down and down and down and down will we want to try to compete with United Airlines or, or British Airways or anyone like that. Now, Sir Richard competes with those people in other, in other spheres with different vehicles. So we'll let him, I, my, my concern frankly is that the suborbital industry becomes a target of the airline industry that sees us flying with a different regulatory regime than airplanes do. But airplanes are a 100-year-old industry, and we are a brand new industry, and we need a different regulatory standard, frankly, than uh, commercial aviation, which is a very mature industry. So, you know, eventually, a lot of these vehicles will make it possible to fly point to point, but if I see someone as the, as the, as the lobbyist for XCOR, if I see someone in the company talking about point to point, I smack them, okay? And you should smack Steve too, because all that does is get us get 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 the companies in trouble uh, with Congress. Uh, we're, we're, we we should not be going there. And by the way, there was a recent Fox News Online story about X Four flying from New York to New York to Tokyo. No, no, no. We're not doing that. The Lynx isn't going to do that. The, the vehicle after Lynx isn't going to do that. 
Could an orbital vehicle do that? Yes, but orbital vehicles aren't going to do that very quickly. Now, if the military wants to buy an orbital vehicle and do that, that's a separate question, but we're not going to be doing that anytime soon. If Sir Richard is watching, I don't plan on smacking you. <laughs> um, I'm interested in the uh, human, the design challenges of the interior um, for both the aircraft. I understand that uh, Virgin Galactic is taking insights from Virgin Atlantic's upper deck as well as Virgin America, and in, um, but I'm sure over time you've experienced some challenges in your design of the interior, as well as it seems that they have to be somewhat of modular spaces to allow researchers as well as passengers into the same vehicle. Perhaps for both of you, I'd be curious to hear a little bit about your insight on that. Yeah, it's a great, great question, and it's something that we put a tremendous amount of thought to, into. Um, at Virgin Galactic, we talk a fair amount about almost everything we're doing. Uh, some might say too much. Um, that is one area that we hardly talk about at all. It's uh, it's the secret sauce in a lot of ways. Um, but a as you mentioned, we we, we are uh, learning lessons from uh, from our sister companies, the airlines. In fact, uh, the gentleman who designed uh, Virgin America, essentially all everything that had to do with design for Virgin America, and who also was a contributor to the uh, the upper class deck on uh, on Virgin Atlantic, is now our head of design. And so he designs both what goes inside the spaceport and what goes inside of the spacecraft. Uh, it's a tough challenge um, because you need something that uh, looks sexy, looks cool. These people have paid a lot of money and they have a, they're accustomed to a certain style of living. But it also has to be extremely functional. You have to make sure that they are comfortable uh, throughout what is, a, you know, relative to a normal airplane ride, a pretty demanding physical experience. Not very demanding compared to a Soyuz ride, but but uh, but by co conventional airline standards, pretty demanding. So. Uh, it is difficult, but as you can also imagine, it's pretty awesome, right? If you're a design engineer uh, and your first career was working on vacuum cleaners for Dyson, as it was for this gentleman, now you're designing the seats on a suborbital spaceship. Uh, I think he loves his job, and we love having him on board. Hi, uh, Nathan from Extraz Foundation. Uh, presumably, both of your companies will be competing for customers in both the human uh, spaceflight arena and the science arena, why is your vehicle going to be better than the person sitting to your side? <laughs> Wait, say that again? The last part? Why is your vehicle going to be better than the person sitting to your side? Oh, the answer is neither one of us know. Okay, uh, we are addressing different aspects of the experience, different aspects of, um, of the value uh, equation, and we're gonna find out. I suspect, I mean, you know, Lord willing, there are gonna be a, a, an unbelievable level of demand for both kinds of experiences, okay? Uh, X-Core is offering a front seat ride. Uh, X-Core is, is giving you an astronaut experience uh, flying into space with a huge window right in front of your eyes as you go to space. Um, uh, Virgin is offering an incredible, uh, exciting, uh, uh, it, you know, uh, you know, passenger experience in space. Um, they have a bigger vehicle. They can fly more people at the same time. We have a smaller vehicle. We can fly the vehicle more cheaply. Okay. How that all works out in the ec economics of the marketplace and what people want to do, you know, I have no idea. We both designed vehicles that we thought would work in the marketplace. That's the great thing about the competitive market is you get to try it, you get to find out. And, uh, you know, obviously the, pe the designers at X-Core thought they were taking the right approach, and I know that the people at Virgin thought they were taking the right approach. And, you know, hopefully both will succeed, and other companies will succeed as well, because the industry won't succeed and the marketplace won't evolve unless you've got multiple companies out there succeeding, earning revenue, plowing those profits back into new designs, new technologies, new concepts to make it even cheaper and more, these vehicles even cheaper and more capable uh, so, that, so that we can in fact dramatically lower the cost, not just of access to space, but the access of, uh, the access to orbit. Because that's gonna blow the barn off everything, so. 
on that. Yeah, I agree. I agree entirely. They're, they're at this point quite different vehicles. It's a different experience, different views out different windows. Some vehicles you have your family along, some vehicles you don't have to have your family along. These appeal to different people. And probably there are people who are interested in, in both experiences. So uh, I see no reason why we couldn't both be successful at the same time. Okay, so I'm going to take on my question. Hi, thanks. So um, you mentioned United Airlines, American Airlines, British Airways. Um, they buy aircraft from Boeing and Airbus predominantly. Can each of you sort of mention your take, your company's take on your spacecraft? Right? So both your building spacecraft, uh, definitely Virgin wants to operate spacecraft. x course talked about what leases and stuff. How do you see that playing out? Do you see someone sort of licensing your vehicles and, and operating them elsewhere? Let me speak to that directly because that really is x -Corps business model. x -Corps does not want to be in the space line business. Okay, um, that is not our, our strength is not in the retail market um, and that's not where we, we, we plan to go. We plan to design and build rockets and rocket powered spaceships. And so we want to be the Boeing, not the United Airlines. I mean, we, we made that choice very early in the company when the company was founded. And, you know, we will do what we have to do in terms of operating vehicles and supporting the operations of vehicles. A wet lease is simply a way of our providing the technical support to a customer that may not even be located in the United States, may be located externally, so that U.S. personnel maintain technical control of the vehicle. But they provide all of the customer-facing experience. They provide the marketing. They provide the sales. They provide the training. They provide all that full experience stuff that, that Will was talking about. Um, and they do it in different locations around the world. They do it in different ways, appealing to different people from different cultures. Um, and they, they, they take the, it's not just, it's not, it's not so much software around the, the hardware. It's, it's more, you know, the, 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 um, the, you know, the, uh, the very high order stuff that, that interfaces with the that interfaces with the customers that's not our strength that doesn't we don't um, we are we are in the steak business not the sizzle business uh, this is a, a great illustration of why when people say that Xcore and virtual Galactic are competitors I disagree um, we're each doing different things you, you have the the companies building the craft and the companies operating the craft um, I wouldn't say that we are the United uh, Airlines uh, of the space industry because I, I don't like United. <laughs> we're, we're the Virgin America uh, of, of the space industry, um, and which is something I really like about it. I, I, I enjoy that we're not a technology development company. We are an implementation, we're an operations company. We are pretty neutral. If there is a better solution out there or if there is a complementary solution out there, that adds to our uh, capability set in a way that our customers are going to find interesting, which is the key point. Uh, we're, we're all about it. We'll, we'll go ahead and we'll add that to the fleet if we can find commercially agreeable terms. There we go. Uh, so with that, I think we're getting, getting the hook. So uh, thanks. I'm glad we did a long question and answer session. These are always more fun. Thanks for your questions.